Hello, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, Conquering Incontinence. I'm Dr. Steve Reinches, the President and CEO of North Kansas City Hospital and Meritas Health. Thank you for joining us. Many factors cause urinary incontinence, which can be painful and disruptive to a woman's quality of life. Our expert speaker today is Dr. Ian Rossbrew, a urogynecologist with Meritus Health Pavilion for Women Pelvic Health and Reconstructive Surgery Clinic. He'll discuss the different types, symptoms, diagnosis, and ways to treat each person's unique issues. As a urogynecologist, Dr. Rossbrew has additional training in the evaluation and treatment of female pelvic organ, muscle, and connective tissue conditions including incontinence. He earned his medical degree from Loma Linda University Medical Center and completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. He's a fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. If you have any questions about urinary incontinence, Submit your questions using the Q&A feature below. We will get to those at the end. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rossbrew. Oh, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as you can see, our title is Conquering Incontinence, which is a fairly optimistic term. Over the course of this conversation, I think you'll see there's a lot of different causes of incontinence as well as the ways to approach this. Sometimes we can kind of easily stamp this out and get right on top of it. Other times it can be more complicated. Our picture here that we have on the right is just to kind of show some of our optimism today. We're gonna to take a glass half full approach to this. It's also to just mention a little bit, a lot of the patients that I have coming in tell me that they restrict fluids to manage their incontinence symptoms. Hopefully over the course of this conversation, you'll see there's a lot of other things we can do to approach this. So this is just a brief overview of what we're gonna to discuss today. Um, it's kind of the who, what, where, when, and why of incontinence. So. First of all, we're going to talk about what incontinence it is, is, who gets incontinence, the different kinds of incontinence, what then we can do to address the problem, and also just some of the new approaches that are coming out. It's always good to start with a nice little quote. So laughter is the best medicine unless you have incontinence. A great urogynecologist named IP Freely quote that. All right, let's start talking about the what of urinary incontinence. So in essence, incontinence is anytime you're losing urine when you don't intend to do so. So it's the involuntary loss of urine. It can be caused by multiple different issues. The problem with this is that, you know, as people, these medical problems aren't just a medical problem. They encompass us as biopsychosocial creatures. So what your incontinence is doing is impacting how you're living your life, the activities you're involved in, the way you see yourself, and can have multiple ramifications. I mean, sometimes the degree that people are scared to leave their house. You know, as it says, it imposes significant lifestyle restrictions because it can impair what you can do because of the degree of the incontinence. It can create problems with sexual function, um, particularly in the setting of nursing homes or involvement of caregivers can really complicate issues. And additionally, it can cause an increased risk for falls. Now, what's your bladder have to do with falling? Well, not much, but Incontinence can lead to getting up multiple times per night. So we'll have people getting up three, four plus times per night. And if they're doing so in the middle of the night and are a little bit frail, it definitely increases that fall risk. So what symptoms do we typically see? Well, first of all, we can have increases in leakage with any kind of activity, such as lifting, running, jumping, um, coughing, laughter, and sneezing can frequently cause this. We'll also get different symptoms where people come in and say, I simply can't make it in time. They just feel like it hits them all of a sudden, they're running to the bathroom, and just as they're getting there, they lose control. Um, a lot of times we'll see people urinating frequently, sometimes as much as every 15 to 30 minutes. Mm. It also poses them at risk, as we'd mentioned earlier, to waking up multiple times per night. Also, we frequently see people saying that they never pass up a bathroom. So if, in anticipation of incontinence, anytime they go by a bathroom, they tend to make a stop just to prevent those incontinence episodes from occurring. Additionally, if they're someplace they're familiar with, they tend to have all the bathrooms mapped out and a routine set up. Uh, another common symptom that we'll frequently see is people finish urinating, think they're all done, stand up and get a little more that comes out. This, this actually happens quite frequently and can occur for a number of different reasons. 
All right, let's talk about some of the who gets incontinence. Now, this is my job security page. So this keeps me busy in the operating room and clinic on a regular basis. Uh, as far as the general population goes, roughly a third of women experience this, and it, it varies by age. So 25% of young women tend to have this issue. Of middle-aged women, you roughly have about 50% that experience this, and in senior women, it's 75%. So it's a very prevalent problem um, that really, until more recently, was not discussed very much. Um, of women that are established in a home, somewhere between 25 and 61% seek help. So obviously what this says by the studies is it ranges quite a bit what this real number is about who comes in to get care. Now, just to put in perspective how big a problem this is, this costs the US $19.5 billion per year. And, and, and that can be a multiple things. That's not just talking about doctor's visits. That's not just talking about surgeries. That's talking about the cost of sanitary pads. That's costing about the cost of medications and burdens that really impact you as the patient. Um, approximately 6% of nursing home visits are, are due to incontinence or a complicating factor. Usually it's in the setting of someone who has some kind of functional or cognitive disability, and you put the extra burden of their incontinence on top of that, and that's what actually puts them into a nursing home. One thing I wanna also point here as a final point is this is not a normal part of aging that you just have to live with. And, and the big nod is this is not something that you should just have to live with. As I said earlier, it significantly impairs some of your ability and, and the ways in which you can live your life and your quality of life. And there are things that we can do about it. Yes, it happens. Yes, it increasingly happens as you get older, but we can approach the problem. All right, what kind of factors predispose you to incontinence? Now, obviously you can see there's a lot here. As we saw from our previous slide, age can be a big factor. And the older you get, the more frequent problems with incontinence becomes. Pregnancy and childbirth are also big factors for two different reasons. One, pregnancy physically just puts more pressure on the pelvis and the pelvic floor that can predispose to these problems. And two, particularly with vaginal deliveries, and especially if you had a vaginal delivery that maybe involved vacuum or forceps, a more difficult vaginal delivery, there can be more trauma that can predispose to damage to the pelvic floor and cause incontinence issues. Um, other things involve your job. You know, if you have a job where you have a labor intensive job, you're frequently doing a lot of heavy lifting and straining, it again predisposes to problems of the pelvic floor, weakness in the pelvic floor, and can lead to incontinence. Obesity can be a big factor here. And actually, there are a number of studies that show that reducing weight can actually help lessen the degree of your symptoms. And it, it really comes down to an issue of how much pressure is on your pelvic floor. There is, of course, like with a lot of things, a component of family history here. So, you know, how strong the things are that hold us together are a big factor, and those are something you inherit from your parents. So, and it's not just maternal heredity here. For instance, if you had a father that had a lot of problems with hernias, it could also be something where you yourself see more problems with either prolapse or incontinence. Lung disease can also be a big factor here in the sense that if you are someone that has a great deal of problems breathing, uh, severe coughing, again, those are things that generate a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor regularly and lead to weakness in the pelvic floor. Diabetes is a big factor here, and this is actually for a couple different reasons. One, and particularly with poorly controlled diabetes, you tend to dump a lot of sugar into your urine. And where sugar goes, also water goes. So as a result, you have a lot higher urine volume. And with that, if you have any kind of incontinence issues, it will aggravate that further. Additionally, with diabetes, and those with diabetes can probably speak to this, you know, you frequently have peripheral nerve testing done, okay? Well, diabetes can also impact the nerves of the bladder, and the more dysfunction we see with those nerves and their ability to control muscle function, the more problems we have with incontinence. And speaking to some of those neurologic issues, too, you can see a list of different problems can lend to incontinence, strokes, dementia, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and particularly people that have spinal cord injuries or low back problems will see a lot of incontinence issues. Probably not surprising to many people here because of what people say to me when they come in, pelvic organ prolapse is a big factor here. Again, it's an, another condition associated with weakness in the pelvic floor. Your caffeine intake can be a big factor here. One, it can be quite irritative to the bladder, and two, it increases urine output. So if you have any kind of incontinence, it really aggravates that. Constipation is also a big problem. Again, this is something where if you have chronic constipation, there's a lot of increases in pressure in the pelvic floor, 
you also have a lot of like nerve stimulation as a result. And so particularly in people that are younger, we can see constipation being a big factor in some of their overactive bladder and incontinence. And then finally here, people that have a lot of urinary tract infections are predisposed to incontinence. Obviously an infection be quite irritating for the bladder. And particularly when you're getting chronic issues with this, your bladder in some sense gets wired to have that irritated response and predisposes you to incontinence. All right, we'll get into some of the types of incontinence. As you can see, there are a number of them. I, I think a lot of people that come in and see me have the assumption that, oh, there's one kind of incontinence and we can kind of approach it all the same. As you can see, there's a myriad of things here. And we'll get into the four most common types, but I'll kind of briefly run through these. Uh, stress incontinence is primarily the kind of incontinence you see with coughing and sneezing. Urge urinary incontinence or detrusor overactivity is basically spastic activity of your bladder. And it's that sensation that all of a sudden you get hit with the need to urinate and can't get there fast enough. Urinary retention can also cause incontinence in the sense that the bladder simply gets too full and just overflows. You can have mixed incontinence, which can be incontinence due to a number of these factors. Uh, there's also fistulas. Fistulas are basically a connection that's not supposed to be there between two different organ structures. So for instance, with incontinence, we're seeing a connection between say the bladder and vagina where there may have been a previous birth injury or prior surgeries. It didn't heal up quite normally. And now there's an abnormal connection that goes between the two. So it's mm. constantly leaking urine. Um, as we pointed out in the previous slide, infections can be a big factor here. We also have something called functional incontinence, where in essence, you can either have various cognitive problems or issues with physical impairments, which make it more difficult for you to get to the bathroom. So whereas if you didn't have those problems, it may be easy for you to get to the bathroom in time. Those limitations make it a problem and result in incontinence. We already discussed some of the neurologic issues involved with incontinence. There's a number of medications that can cause incontinence and, all, and also there's a number of different metabolic problems that can cause incontinence. You know, as we'd mentioned, probably diabetes being one of the main ones. So we'll start diving into some of the more common causes of incontinence. I'm really gonna highlight four here and kind of explain them in more depth. So the first here is stress urinary incontinence. Essentially, I think of stress urinary incontinence as more of an anatomical cause of your incontinence, meaning something doesn't have good support and is weakened and as a result you leak. So as you can see from our picture here that's up in the right top or top right hand corner, we have a model of the bladder and we have a model of some of the support around the bladder and urethra. Particularly when we're talking about stress incontinence, we're talking about problems with support around the urethra. Uh, and in the diagram there, you can see it says PUL, that's a pubic urethral ligament, okay? That essentially makes a hammock below the urethra. Now, previously, prior to the mid nineties, we primarily thought that stress incontinence occurred because of weakness at the bladder neck itself. In, in 19, it was 95, uh, Dr. Olmsten did a study where he used a pressure catheter and pulled it from the bladder through the urethra to see where the highest pressure point was. And surprisingly at that point, everyone thought it should have been at the bladder sphincter right there at the bladder neck where in truth, it was where you see the puborethral ligament in the middle of urethra. So it changed some of how we think of and approach stress urinary incontinence. Now, this is the kind of incontinence where people have like increases in abdominal pressure that result in leakage again, because physically the bladder can't compensate for that increased abdominal pressure and subsequently leaks a little bit. Usually it's a small volume that you leak. Occasionally it can be bigger, but particular activities like laughing and coughing, sneezing, doing exercise, especially high impact exercises, um, lifting, or, or what a lot of moms will tell me is they avoid trampolines at all costs anymore because these are things that lead to them leaking. Now with this kind of incontinence, this is typically what we see in our middle-aged women. So the highest incidence of stress incontinence occurs in women 45 to 49. And one thing that I look for when I do an exam in the office is something we call urethral hypermobility. In essence, that area where you see that pubic urethral ligament, when someone bears down or coughs in clinic, the mobility at that point should be fairly limited because it's restricted by that ligament. Whereas someone who has pretty classic stress incontinence will see increased movement of that greater than 30 degrees. Now that's not always absolutely indicative of stress incontinence, but it's definitely a physical finding that we'll frequently see. 
And then finally, one nuance on stress urinary incontinence we'll talk about is something called intrinsic sphincter dysfunction. Now, to some degree, all stress incontinence has intrinsic sphincter dysfunction, but this is really a problem where we're talking about the inability of the bladder neck itself to restrict the flow of urine. So we're talking about the muscle, the sphincter muscle that is right at the bladder neck and it can't stay closed well enough. And there are various things like radiation or neurologic problems that can contribute to that. All right, our second main kind of incontinence is urge urinary incontinence. So this is the kind of incontinence where basically your bladder's gotten a hair trigger. So people will come in and say, oh, I just can't make it to the bathroom fast enough. Or they'll tell me that they just waited too long, which frequently is not the case. It's just that they feel they waited too long because they couldn't make it to the bathroom in time when they had symptoms to go. And I, I mean, this is to the degree where I have people that are in the bathroom every one to two hours and still come in and tell me that it's just because they're waiting too long, where in truth, their bladder has developed this hair trigger and a slight little bit of urine, a slight little change in pressure causes their bladder to essentially spasm and want to force all the urine out. Some of these triggers aren't just physical too. I mean, you can have various psychologic triggers, like is really common for people when they're coming home and pulling into the garage. As soon as they're starting to get out of their car, they trigger that they have to go use the bathroom or something as simple as they hear running water, put their hands in the running water will trigger them to have to use the bathroom. Now on the right over here, we have somewhat of a complex diagram, just trying to explain urge urinary incontinence. Now to contrast this against stress incontinence, urge incontinence is a functional problem with the bladder in the sense that stress was an anatomic problem. So you can have all the support in the world and have horrible urge incontinence because basically with urge incontinence, the connection between those muscles and nerves aren't working appropriately. Now with our bladder, we basically have two main nervous systems that control bladder function. One is the parasympathetic, the other is the sympathetic, and they act opposite one another. So for instance, when you're trying to store urine in your bladder, in essence, the parasympathetic system is relaxed, whereas the sympathetic system is activated. So the sympathetic system is constricting the neck of the bladder so that it doesn't let urine out, whereas the parasympathetic system is relaxing the wall of the bladder to allow it to stretch, okay? You know, the opposite being said for when you go to empty. The parasympathetic system is triggered, which causes the bladder to then empty. The sympathetic system relaxes, which re allows the neck of the bladder to then relax. Now, the problem with stress incontinence, or sorry, apologize, urge urinary incontinence, is these signals kind of get triggered too early and aren't acting mm -hmm. appropriately. So you initially get a stretch receptor in the wall of the bladder that then sends a signal to your tailbone. Okay, That signal then is supposed to relay up to your brain and your brain decides what you want to do with that information if it's an appropriate time to use the bathroom or not. Unfortunately, when we're talking about urge incontinence, it's almost like your bladder gets a knee-jerk reflex. So you get that initial trigger signal to go use the bathroom. And instead of it relaying up to your brain, you get this micturition reflex where you immediately get a signal back to the bladder saying, no, it's just time to empty. That parasympathetic system just fires and then you can't control your urine. One nuance on this is what we have listed there below is the overactive bladder. Now, wet overactive bladder essentially means you have urge urinary incontinence, whereas dry overactive bladder tells you that, okay, your bladder is acting the way it would with urge urinary incontinence. However, you still have enough control that you're able to make it in time, but you're having to run to the bathroom frequently. So you're going to the bathroom all the time. You're frequently up at night, even though you might not have incontinence all the time. And again, this is a problem that's more common in older women. So for instance, we might see women in their mid forties treat their stress urinary incontinence, and then they're coming in in their later fifties and early sixties, complaining that their incontinence has occurred and thinking it might be the same thing where usually it's a case where they've gone from having stress incontinence when they were younger to urge incontinence now that they're older. Now we'll talk some about urinary retention and it seems somewhat counterintuitive. Why would urinary retention end up result in you leaking urine? And it's essentially like my dam here on the right. Basically the bladder just gets so full and is emptying so poorly that it physically overflows. And, and the hard thing with urinary retention is the symptoms can masquerade as both stress and urgent incontinence. So for instance, I will have women coming in saying, oh, anytime they lift or cough or sneeze or jump, they'll lose a little bit of urine. Well, it's not necessarily because they don't have enough support underneath the urethra, 
or support to the pelvic floor, it's actually because the bladder is already so full that it just can't take anything without spilling over. They will also come in and tell you that you're going, they're going to the bathroom all the time or that they're up all night. And that's because they're emptying their bladder so little that it fills back up so quickly that they're having to go to the bathroom frequently. Now, urinary retention can occur for a couple different reasons. One, you can actually have physical weakness of the bladder itself. So what we call bladder atony or underactivity. And the bladder physically can't generate enough force to empty appropriately. The other thing could be that the bladder is obstructed. So there's something along the course of the urethra that is preventing it from emptying. It's basically a blockage there. And both result in retention and both can cause overflow. And there's also something that it's, some people develop where it's almost like they have an arrhythmia of their bladder. Their bladder will have small frequent contractions, but can actually never generate a good strong contraction to empty completely. All right, and then finally, what we'll talk about our fourth main cause is mixed urinary incontinence. Now this is more of a fun one and something we actually see fairly commonly in that you don't just have one type of incontinence, you have multiple types of incontinence that can kind of feed off of each other and can actually make treatment even a little more challenging because sometimes the things we do to correct one kind of incontinence might impact the other incontinence in a negative way. So we have to be a little bit more careful with our treatment approach and sometimes evaluate things a little more thoroughly. All right, as far as when you come into the office, what's gonna happen? So like any office visit, like starts with us just talking to you, probably 75, 80% of the diagnosis we can usually make simply by talking to you and listening to what it is you say. You know, in that we can try and figure out what kind of things lead to your symptoms um, and what risk factors there are, and that can kind of help us hone in on the type of incontinence that might be present. We further confirm this then with the typical physical exam, particularly the pelvic examination. You know, I mentioned already, we will look for urethral mobility. We'll also look for issues with prolapse or any changes in tissue. We oftentimes check a urinalysis or almost always check a urinalysis. Again, not only does urinary incontinence result from infectious issues, but urinary incontinence can contribute to infectious problems. So we need to rule that out of the equation. One issue that we will frequently check, and again, this goes back to the problems we have with urinary retention, is that we check post-void residuals, meaning how much urine is left over in the bladder after you've just thought you've emptied it. You know, we're trying to rule out that overflow incontinence or that urinary retention component because it can frequently masquerade in, with both stress symptoms and urge symptoms. One tool that we sometimes use too are something called validated questionnaires. <clears throat> These are basically questionnaires that have been studied and are predictive factors that help it clue us into which kind of incontinence you have. Frequently, they're used in research settings. We will use them in clinic settings and particularly one place that I like to use it is something where we're tracking symptom response. It can be helpful to see how those scores change based on what treatment modalities we begin with. Excuse me one minute. A lot of talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing, and this is something I'll particularly do in patients that have more complicated symptoms is do a bladder diary. You know, I'll have patients that particularly with severe incontinence will come in and tell me that they just leak all the time and have a hard time characterizing what triggers them to leak. A diary can really be helpful in the sense that we have them record all the times they urinate, all the times they leak, how much they're urinating, and what their fluid intake looks like over the course of the day, and try and figure out where we're running into problems and help tease apart some of that symptomatology. Again, another approach for complicated patients is something called urodynamics. Okay, this is, again, someone who, say, has a complicated mixed picture or something where when I do their examination, it really doesn't confirm what I would expect based on their symptoms. This is a test where we have you come in. It typically takes 30 to 45 minutes to do. And we basically hook the bladder up to a set of catheters and pressure sensors, as well as things that determine muscle activity and have you urinate, fill your bladder, try and provoke some of the incontinence episodes so that we can get more nitty gritty about which things are leading to you having incontinence. And then finally, one thing we'll do is something called cystoscopy. This is essentially just looking the bladder with a camera, which can be particularly helpful in people that have retention issues, people that have frequent infections. 
All right. We'll go over some of the things that people tell me that they come into the office and kind of like my picture of Troy over here, you know, usually there's a kernel of truth to these statements. So first thing I hear a lot with people coming in with an incontinence problem that they'll tell me is their bladder is falling. Actually, a falling bladder and a leaky bladder can be completely different things. Now, you will see them occur together frequently, but one does not actually beget the other. For instance, there, if I can go in and fix prolapse, you know, do a surgical repair of prolapse and actually make incontinence problems worse because their prolapse was causing a kink in the urethra, which was resulting in less urine output and slowing the flow of that urine. And when I take that kink out, it can actually worsen their incontinence. So again, falling bladder and leaky bladder can be very different things. Second thing I'll have plenty of patients come in and say is that they just want what their friend had done. You know, I'd seen their friend previously, their friend had referred this patient into me, they're really happy with the care they've gotten, and they just wanted to have what they had done. Well, as we've kind of already alluded to, there's a lot of different things that can contribute to you having incontinence. And so the approach to that incontinence might differ because of which kind of incontinence you have, and it might not be the same as what your friend had done. I'll oftentimes have patients that come in and tell me that they didn't come in earlier because they quite, weren't quite ready for surgery to treat this. Um, and I would say in general, if you look at studies, frequently people are having incontinence for a year or more before they come seek treatment. Now, the misconception here is that not all incontinence is a surgical approach. Now, I would say with stress incontinence, as we said, one that has more of an anatomical issue, you can see more surgical correction as a first-line treatment, whereas, say, over your overactive bladder, urgent incontinence problems, it's more of a functional problem, and there are different modalities we'll take in pursuing that. We'll kind of get into that further. I'll also have people that come in and tell me that they've been told by other people or even physicians that they may just need to have a hysterectomy to correct their incontinence. Now, the assumption here is that they probably have prolapse getting back to point number one, my bladder is falling. And they assume that the fix for their prolapse is just removing their uterus, where in truth, that's not. The uterus is actually kind of the innocent bystander in this whole circumstance. And it's actually issues with loss of support that lead to prolapse. However, as we've already discussed, Prolapse doesn't necessarily mean that you have incontinence. And then the final thing here is people delay coming in just because they think that this is part of aging and that this is just a normal course of things and if it's something they just have to tolerate, which hopefully as we get further into this, you'll see is not necessarily true. All right, so we'll start off the things that you yourself as a patient can do. First thing is dietary changes. Now, this isn't necessarily diet to induce weight loss. However, as we discussed, and it's here on the slide as well, weight loss can help some of these symptoms in cases of obesity, but there are certain things that trigger the bladder and are irritated to bladder and will promote further incontinence. So particularly caffeine is a big one that we see. You know, I will have patients that come in and are having multiple coffees through the morning that they then transition into their tea or sweet tea or soda later in the day and are telling me they leak on a regular basis. Well, a lot of the times I can get them to stop those caffeinated beverages and we will see improvements in their leakage substantially. Also things that are high in acids or sugars tend to lead to more incontinence because of the irritative effect and we've already discussed with sugars too, it just increases urine output. Um, regarding pelvic floor exercises, you can actually find a number of different pelvic floor exercises on YouTube or Pinterest. And there are ways that you can start doing some of the exercises to strengthen that pelvic floor, which both gains not just strength, but also control of muscle function. So particularly, let's say stress incontinence. With someone with stress incontinence, I'm trying to get them to improve strength of their pelvic floor. Well, as with urge incontinence, it's a little different. Their pelvic floor might be strong enough. However, the way the muscle and nerve are interacting is the problem. And if we can get them doing exercises, it gets those coordinating together. So it's almost like the difference between stress incontinence being a power lifter working out versus urge incontinence being a ballerina. Both might be working really hard, but very different approaches to treat different issues. Uh, we also have now out on the market, something we call biofeedback devices. So these are devices that can go inside the vagina and actually give you feedback on how well you're performing those pelvic floor exercises. So they can link to your phone, 
They tell you how much the muscle is actually contracting and they even have games that you can play that link up to it. So you, by contracting your pelvic floor, you play these games. Recently, there was just a study that came out on this first one, Leva, that actually showed very promising results. Um, and LV is something that we've had out on the market for a while that you can purchase yourself. Poison Pressa inserts. Now, those of you that have problems with incontinence are probably familiar with poise because of poise pads. Now, the Impressa inserts are different in the sense that they're kind of like a tampon, except they have an area that's thicker and pushes against the urethra more. So particularly with stress incontinence problems can be that just little extra support under the urethra that provides a uh, reduction in the incontinence. So this might be someone who really only leaks when they go to the gym. They might put one of these in before they go to the gym. They just get that extra little bit of support and don't have a problem. And then finally, out on the market, and I know people have seen commercials for this, there's pelvic floor stimulators, and one is the Innovo. Um, really, we're looking into this further, but basically the Innovo is like a set of spandex that you can put on that electrically stimulates the muscle through the spandex with electrodes to make the muscle contract. So it's essentially doing the pelvic floor exercise for you. All right. Now we'll get to some of the things that I can do as your physician to help this out. And we'll start with stress incontinence. First thing as we kind of already alluded to is physical therapy. And we talked about doing pelvic floor exercises on your own. Those work great, but actually we see improved results if you're working with a physical therapist. And particularly when we're talking about stress incontinence, in general, 50% of women will see improvement in their stress incontinence and maintain that improvement at the one year mark. So. Mm -hmm. It definitely has a role, definitely has an impact. I would say particularly women that are seeing their incontinence on the younger side of things, this is something I strongly encourage. After physical therapy though, with stress incontinence, we really start talking about surgery more. Again, we're, we're trying to create an anatomical weakness below the urethra and bladder neck. Right now, the standard of care for treating stress incontinence is a mid-urethral sling, which you know, if you've seen commercials in the last 10 years, has gotten somewhat of a bad rap, but really that's because of the problems with mesh associated with prolapse repairs, not mid urethral slings. You know, when mid urethral slings are now the most studied device we have for treating stress urinary incontinence. They've also been compared to all the other surgical methods we have of treating stress incontinence and do a better job with a low complication rate. So how good a job do they do? Well, typically we see about an 85 to 90% improvement in stress incontinence, which is not small. And it is for a procedure that typically takes about 15 minutes to do. Now, something that's a little newer to the market here, and I, and I say this is a new spin on an old procedure, is urethral bulking. Now, we've had urethral bulking for multiple years, except we were using different products to do the bulking. So with urethral bulking, essentially, I go in with a cystoscope with that camera into the urethra and take a needle and inject a substance at the bladder neck. So essentially I just thicken up the tissue in the area of the bladder neck so it doesn't take as much force to close it off. Now the older products that we had, such as collagen, they would work, but over the course of three years would tend to wear off. And, and so our overall success rates were about 35%. There is a newer product now called Bulkamid, which is actually a gel we insert. And this gel is hydrophilic, meaning it likes water. And actually water fills the structure of the gel and makes up 98% of the gel hmm. structure and provides long-term stability. Right now, and this is based on seven-year studies, we see between a 69 and 83% success rate. So in essence, this is not quite as good as a sling, but getting pretty darn close. And actually for a procedure that's slightly less invasive, and the thing that's a little bit better about it is, and at least based on the seven-year data we have, is that people aren't having problems because of the gel. Whereas with a sling, in, in general, we see about 5% of people coming back that we might have to modify the gel because it's not behaving how we want it to or causing pain or maybe an exposure area. Thus far, based on the seven year data, we're not seeing that with this bulking agent, but mm -hmm. you know, just to put this in some perspective, we have 20 year data on sling. So we have a lot more information still. And finally, one, one final point I'll make here is something called copal suspensions, which occasionally are done. However, I think it's probably been at least 10 years since I last did one of these. Um, this is an older technique where we would essentially use the vaginal wall like a sling. 
Okay, we would take the area of the vaginal wall just behind the urethra and tack it up behind the pelvic bones in a couple different ways to help support that area and provide that basically hammock underneath the urethra. Except at that time, the thinking was we were actually putting it at the bladder neck. So it works, it works well, but again, it's not doesn't work quite as well as a sling and actually is a much more complicated mm -hmm. procedure with higher complication rates and a higher rate that people return to surgery. All right, now we'll jump into urge incontinence. Again, very different approach to incontinence problems. So with stress incontinence, we talk about physical therapy and then surgery. Urge is different in the sense that we go from physical therapy, which actually it works very well with. I actually like sending people to physical therapy more for their urge symptoms or medications. Hmm. Now with the medications, we have a slew of different options that I'll basically break down into two categories. One are anti-muscarinics. Now, if you remember from our slide where we talked about urge urinary incontinence, we were talking about that parasympathetic system that causes your bladder to empty. Well, anti-muscarinics are acting on that parasympathetic system. So they're trying to induce the bladder to relax by, stimulate, by, by inhibiting or blunting that parasympathetic response. But as a result, we see other side effects to other things that have parasympathetic effects. So people will get dry mouth and dry eyes and constipation. And one issue that we worry about, and we're getting more data that's been coming out on is actually dementia. And it's that use of these medications, and it does vary some by which of these medications we use can increase the risk for dementia. So for instance, in my little picture, you can see where it says ditropan. That is a very small molecule that easily crosses the barrier between the blood and the brain. So it gets into the brain and thus we think probably has a higher risk for some of this dementia. Whereas we have other agents, it's a bigger molecule and probably doesn't do that as much. And one other issue we have to be particularly careful with here is glaucoma. There's a certain kind of glaucoma, which is an increase in pressure in the eye and using these agents can cause problems where that pressure increases so much that can lead to blindness. So frequently with glaucoma, we're trying to use a different medication to treat this problem. So with that, let's get to the other medications. And these are kind of the newer kids on the block. So our medications are beta agonists. So these act on the sympathetic system. So they're actually stimulating the sympathetic system because stimulation of the sympathetic system results in storage in the bladder. So we only have two medications here right now. That's Merbetric and Gemtessa. Gemtessa is actually the newest kid on the block here. Being that both of these are newer agents tends to mean we have more problems with coverage issues. So this is something where we have to do a lot more work with the insurance companies in trying to get coverage. Now, the side effect profile is very different in the sense it, it's stimulating sympathetic response, which is that fight or flight response. And so with like particularly Merbetric, we have to be more cautious with hypertension or increases in blood pressure. You can see increases in heart rate. Sometimes people will get headaches or diarrhea or runny noses too. Again, because of its effects on the cardiovascular system, we're also pretty careful with kidney disease and some liver problems. Um, and as I said, the biggest issue we probably have in using these medications is just the cost. You know, these, the, if this isn't covered, this is definitely something that you try and break the bank. You can see I put a little picture of a coupon here. These do work. However, the hard thing is these, these coupons don't work for Medicare or Medicaid or other government sponsored programs. It's only if you have a commercial insurance. All right, after we failed physical therapy and medications with urge incontinence, we start getting to some of the surgical approaches. And these surgical approaches are very different than stress incontinence because again, we're not trying to correct anatomy. So one thing that we can start with sometimes is done in a clinic is called posterior tibial neuromodulation. So essentially we take an acupuncture needle, we put it into a nerve that's right there behind your ankle and are essentially using that nerve like a jumper cable to stimulate the sacral nerves that lead to the bladder. Hmm. And by doing that with a pulse and doing it for 30 minutes at a time once a week, we can see an improvement in urge incontinence. Now, this starts off with weekly treatments for 12 weeks. So it is kind of cumbersome as far as how frequently you have to come in. And the other thing is, is once you stop doing the treatments, the problems can start to come back. So we frequently have to have some kind of maintenance protocols where you're coming in every month or two months. I have a few patients who can go out six months and still keep the effect of this. Mm -hmm. The next step beyond that is actually something where we would implant a stimulator. And that's what our diagram is in the lower right-hand corner. 
This is a two-step procedure where I first step is we put in two wires to make sure that this works. So with a needle, I place two wires into the tailbone at the S3 foramen, which is a little tic-tac sized hole in the tailbone and feed a wire down there. We then hook that to an external battery at first for the trial and make sure that stimulating that nerve actually results in a 50% improvement in your symptoms. Now, if it does that, then we can move on to the actual implantation. And with that, we basically put a wire underneath the skin and then bring it over to something that's like a pacemaker battery that then constantly sends that stimulation to that nerve to override the abnormal signals that are resulting in your incontinence. Uh, you can see in the picture, we have a couple different batteries there. And actually there's another company now that's come out with technology and doing this as well. Um, but in relation to the quarter, you can, we have first the Interstim 2 there, which has now been updated to the Interstim X, which is the same size, but it's a battery that lasts 10 to 15 years and then has to be replaced. We also have a rechargeable option, which is smaller, but requires charging about once a week. Now, the, the, the other company that's out with this now has a battery that's good for 20 years and also rechargeable, and the recharging has to be done every two to weeks to four weeks. Um, these devices are MRI safe. Now, the reason I say this is prior to 2020, they were not. So if you had one of these wires put in before 2020, you couldn't get an MRI of your abdomen or lower extremities because of the risk that it would abnormally stimulate this cord that we put in you. Now they've changed the installation on it. It works better. And so we don't have those problems. Another approach we can take to urge incontinence is injection of Botox. Now, some people probably associate Botox with putting it in your forehead to treat wrinkles, but we can, in some sense, do a similar thing in the bladder. You know, it, with urge incontinence, we're having problems where there's uncontrolled contractions of the bladder itself. Botox works by paralyzing the muscle. So I can go in and put a series of injections along the back wall of the bladder, partially paralyze it. It helps relax the bladder and results in fewer incontinence episodes. Again, this approach is about 80% effective. Um, and they've actually done a study that shows that it works better than putting in the stimulator. Now, in truth, both of them are about an 80% improvement. And in the study, the amount of improvement was one incontinent episode per day. So it was real, but some of how we approach it very much can be patient dependent. The downside of the Botox is that it's only effective for a short period of time. You know, this is a procedure that it wears off and we have to repeat it on average every six months. Some patients, it might be every three months, other patients, it might be 10 months. The other problem we'll sometimes see, and this is a temporary thing, is that the Botox works too well and since it paralyzes the bladder too much and you can't urinate then. And this is somewhat dose dependent and we use two different doses to treat this, you know, there's a 4% risk that you might have urinary retention with the lower dose and an 8% risk with the higher dose. And what that means for you is that we have to teach you how to intermittently catheterize until your bladder starts waking up enough to go on its own. And usually that's a short-term problem within a few weeks. And there's even studies that show that people that have had this problem been ones that had the retention issue, they still usually choose to come back and do the Botox because of how well it worked in controlling their urge incontinence. All right, we'll get into urinary retention a little bit. So again, and probably you're catching a theme here, physical therapy. So this is another thing where physical therapy can be helpful because again, we're getting those muscles and nerves to interact more appropriately together. We can also use medications. However, these medications are very different. And these are you know, what's called alpha adrenergic blockers. Again, we're acting on that sympathetic system, but this time we're trying to get the neck of the bladder to relax more so there's less resistance there and it helps improve bladder emptying. The unfortunate thing is we don't have any medications that improve how well the bladder can physically contract. It, anecdotally, they had used some different agents to try and do this because they can stimulate that parasympathetic pathway. However, they've not actually improved the problems with retention. Now, this is another role for neuromodulation. In a sense, those sacral stimulators that we talked about that can treat urgent continence can also treat retention. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, think of this almost like we're turning the nerve back on. You know, we're sending a signal to it, we get that pulse firing, and it eliminates some of the abnormal signals that are resulting in the retention. In an 18-month trial, we saw 69% of people eliminate catheter use, which if you're someone using a catheter is a big number. Mm -hmm. And that, that data has long-term support in the sense that five-year data shows that 
people still are improved. It's not an effect that just wears off quickly. And finally, this is a screen probably everyone would like me to block out, but with urinary retention, we do have to get to the point where we're using catheters sometimes, and that can be in a couple of different forms. The preferable form is intermittent catheterization, meaning that you have some short catheters that you yourself place just when you need to urinate. Um, and usually you have to carry those in your purse or have on hand. Um, you can frequently just do that in the bathroom. Now, when that fails, or if there's other physical conditions that make that difficult to perform, we sometimes have to place a catheter. That could be a catheter that's going into the bladder through, through the urethra, or actually one that can go through the skin, um, through the lower portion of the abdomen straight into the bladder. Now, people, a lot of times, they're, well, their sphincters pucker when I talk about catheters, which is understandable. Um, the advantage of doing the intermittent catheter, which can be a significant mental hurdle, is it is actually less of an infection risk compared to an indwelling catheter, right? Not having that catheter just in intermittently doesn't cause as many urinary tract infections. It also means that you're not carrying a bag around with you all the time that urine is draining into you. You functionally are normal and can function normally because you don't have other things that are attached to you all the time. So it can be a big quality of life issue and can help sleep because you don't have a catheter in there all the time that's tugging or pulling. Now, with that said, with catheters of any type, you can still get infections. So we still see problems with people getting urinary tract infections that have to intermittently catheterize. It can cause irritation to the urethra or urethritis. Um, sometimes a catheter will result in a little bit of bleeding. And as I said, like people, you just have to have catheters on hand to help urinate. And, and kind of, as I already alluded to, one of the issues we sometimes see is compliance, meaning people wanting to do this. You know, understandably, this can be a big mental hurdle and some people just don't want to even broach it. All right, and a final thing we'll get to here is what's new. So this is new and it's new enough that they actually don't even have procedure codes yet to do this. So, you know, frequently with a surgery, if I were to do it, I have a procedure code to bill. They haven't even developed that yet. So there's actually no billing system for this. This is building off that posterior tibial neuromodulation. So that was where I used an acupuncture needle to stimulate the nerve behind your ankle and then improve your urge and continent symptoms. Well, this is a little different in the sense we're actually implanting a stimulator that stays in there and it goes behind the ankle. And so it's constantly stimulating. So that way you're not having to come in for weekly visits for 12 weeks and then come in for maintenance visits after that. And thus far, this is showing really good data. You know, in 68% of participants, they saw a 50% reduction in symptoms, which that could be the difference between going from 12 incontinent episodes today down to six. And they also recently just had a study where they had patients that had done this are now coming back to have the battery replaced because the battery died over time. And they're seeing continued responses that are improved in, in that study, which was smaller, um, had an 80% success rate. So in essence, this is something that can be done in the office and has good success rates. So hopefully we see this continuing to evolve and even other device manufacturers are starting to get on board and look into doing things like this. All right. And with that, I am done and we'll open up the floor for questioning. I'm fascinated with this talk. I'm fascinated with that posterior tibial uh, uh, device. I'm also fascinated with the sacral implant that it's for both retention and incontinence. Is so it the same implant? It's the same exact implant. And the same we procedure. We program it the same way. That's fascinating. Yeah, and really with that, so with mm -hmm. the sacral stimulator, you actually have four different contact points mm -hmm. so that just you know how it's laying on the nerve to see how it improves effect. And really the programming isn't any different retention versus yeah. urgent continence. The other thing to consider there too, and we didn't talk about this here, but the stimulators can improve fecal incontinence as well because oh. you're acting on that sacral nerve and it's that sacral nerve that impacts both rectal function as well as bladder function. Does it, uh, does it work for spinal cord injured patients? Uh, it can, it's, it can be harder. Okay. The success rates okay. are lower, but we do have some success in that realm. And actually yeah. I have patients that have had success. So there's people listening other than you and I. So let's yeah. get to the audience. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Here's some questions. Does Mcella help with your urge incontinence and frequency? Now I am not familiar with Mcella, so I would have to look into that further. I mean, like I said, like there's a number of products that are like Innovo that mm -hmm. are really coming newer to the market that we don't have as much data on. And so we're trying to figure some of those out and we'll see what pans out there. 
Okay. What about um, Kegel exercises for pelvic full floor strengthening? Does that help with incontinence? Absolutely. And, and this gets back to what we were talking about earlier in the sense that Kegel exercises are basically contraction of those pelvic floor muscles and, and you know, doing it rhythmic pattern. So essentially you're contracting like you're trying to stop the flow of urine. However, you shouldn't do it when you're urinating. You should do it at other times when you're just sitting in a chair, but you contract like you're trying to stop the flow of urine and almost feel like you lift an elevator and then hold it. And ideally at first you won't be able to hold as long, but goal being that you get to holding it 10 plus seconds at a time, getting better innervation to those muscles. And then we can see improvements again in both stress incontinence, urge incontinence and retention issues. Here's another question. How do you know if the LV trainer is right for you and where can you purchase the LV trainer? So you can actually purchase the LV online. Okay. So it, it is readily accessible. The uh, IEVA or the LEVA, which I had also mentioned, I actually have an email to the company trying to figure out if that's something we, we can do prescription. And I'm mm -hmm. waiting on that response because literally it was just this month that they had a trial that broke on that. Um, but the LV you can obtain just online. Um, and as far as do I know if it's going to work for you? Honestly, I can't say for certain. And again, it depends on your kind of incontinence. So for instance, with stress incontinence, it's probably going to have about a 50% response rate. Whereas with urgent incontinence, we're probably looking at 60, 65% plus. Hmm, that's great. Here's another question. Is there a limit to the amount of water or liquids that I should drink each day to ease the symptoms of incontinence? I would say absolutely not. Okay. You know, the, the goal of treating your incontinence is not to have you get dehydrated. You know, okay. so a lot of times we'll hear like how much you how much should you drink in a day? Okay. And particularly people that are coming in with incontinence, try and limit it because the more urine output they have, the more episodes of incontinence they have. Well, the goal is that we're treating incontinence so that you're hydrating appropriately. Mm -hmm. And they actually have studies on looking, okay, how much is a good amount? And it actually has less to do with how much you're drinking as the individual, but more on the characteristics of your urine. Okay. So in essence, like if your urine is really dark and concentrated, you need to be drinking more. If your urine is as clear as the water you're drinking and you're going a large volume every two hours, well, you need to be drinking less and okay. using that as a better gauge for how much you should hydrate. Okay. Here's another question. Are there specific common medicines that cause a worsening of incontinence? Oh, absolutely. There are. Um, I would say particularly, and this really comes down to issues with heart failure too. We see this a lot people that are on various diuretics for their hypertension, mm -hmm. you know, the water pills, or they have heart failure and are on Lasix. Those things increase the output of urine, which increases the problems with incontinence and sometimes makes it very difficult to control. There's also other agents that are used to treat both diabetes and heart failure, like Genuvia. Mm -hmm. They work great for treating those things. However, the way they work is by increasing the loss of sugar into the urine. Well, as we pointed out with diabetes, yes. the more sugar you're dumping into the urine, the more urine output you're going to have, the worse your incontinence. And the other flip side of that is it can increase urinary tract infections because then you make the urine this nice place for bacteria to want to grow because it's really sweet. Yeah. And as we get more infections, we get more incontinence. Okay. Um, what can happen if someone waits too long to seek treatment for incontinence? Does it make it harder to treat? Are the results less uh, successful? Not absolutely. No. And like I said earlier in the study, it, generally speaking, people that come in and have been experiencing incontinence for a long period of time before seeking treatment. I would say that's especially true for stress incontinence, usually because they're seeing it earlier in life. It's a nuisance, but not such a big problem that is mm -hmm. impacting everything they're doing. And again, the point where we are wanting to treat here is because it's having impact that, yeah. you know, because it's negatively impacting what you're doing and how you function, there's then real benefit to the treatment. And it, you know, makes some of the risk of either medications or surgeries worth it. Mm -hmm. And how does a person know if they need surgery? Uh, well, basically evaluation. I mean, I mean, it's hard to say just based on symptoms, whether or not you do or don't need surgery. Um, that really comes down to coming into the clinic, being evaluated, seeing what factors are contributing to your incontinence and working from there. And, and particularly like, let's say urge exam is a good example. I mean, the start is not surgery. Mm -hmm. you, it can be terrible, terrible problems with incontinence or controlling your life. 
but the start is not surgery. It's only after you failed medication and physical therapy that we're starting to talk about some of those surgeries. So you're a specialist in neurogynecology. Does it require a referral from another doctor to come see you or can a patient who has incontinence or retention just call you up and come in? Uh, that somewhat is dependent on the insurance. I would okay. say I, I see a lot of both. You know, okay. I will have patients that will self-refer and come in on their own because of their insurance policies. I also have a large number of patients that come in because they were referred to their primary care physicians. Okay. Well, that's great. This has been very informative. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Rossbrew. We hope that Dr. Rossbrew's presentation was both informative and helpful. Please join us Thursday, July 14th for our next Lunch and Learn presentation fight your brain pain with Dr. Steve Kosa, neurologist with Meritas Health Neurology. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a good afternoon.